in our hands. Here we stand. I'm a teacher, I'm black, and I'm a man. The man, hard in the man, intelligent the man, integrity in the man. In the man, teach, mentor, volunteer. Yeah, man. Welcome again to the In Demand podcast. Um, we're going to start a series called The Bar Exam. Um, this is where we basically just take uh, lyrics and we examine them. Um, everybody on the call uh, has a background in hip hop um, in, our, in my classroom and, and a lot of the brothers on the call um, in our classroom. Some of the ways that we introduce topics, uh, we introduce um, just uh uh, class. Uh, we may use um, hip hop music lyrics from hip hop and just have a discussion with it. So we kind of want to um, demonstrate that and then also, you know, do it um, amongst ourselves as well. Um, so that's what the bar exam is. We're examining lyrics. Um, in this case, because we're going into um, MLK, uh, the MLK holiday, which I, which I say, I don't know what you guys think, fellas, but uh, I think we get a couple weeks in January for Black History Month. I always say Black History Month officially kicks off with, with MLK Day. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, so when we say we got the shortest uh, month, we get a couple other we- couple uh, extra weeks from January starting with MLK weekend. And so with the um, with the uh, bar exam, we want to um, in this this particular one, we want to call it the Black History Playlist. And so we're going to be introducing songs. Um, that talks about black history. Um, with this particular broadcast, we're gonna talk about songs that talk about uh, Martin Luther King. Um, um, yeah, so uh, we have a couple songs on deck that we'll discuss and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, my name is Quan Nellums, um, teaching, a 15 year teacher. Uh, I taught for 15 years, this is my third year as a school counselor. So I've been in the game for about 18 years. I've been serving youth for over 20 years. So um, native of Detroit, uh, graduated from Mumford High School, founder of In Demand. In Demand is a program that seeks to recruit black men as educators, mentors, and volunteers within schools. So uh, that's who I am. Uh, I'm Rob Wallace. Uh, I taught for eight years um, in Northwest Detroit. Um, I was an administrator. After that, for 10 years um, in the metro Detroit area. Um, You can hear me okay? Yeah, brother, man. Oh, yeah. And um, now I am the director of a federally funded program to assist with uh, college preparation to get students to and through college. So I'm happy to be here. All right. Let's go, Cal. Hello, everybody. My name is Calvin Nellum. I am your favorite science teacher up in Detroit. Six years. I'm originally from New Orleans. You probably can't tell because I don't have the accent, but I got a big heart. I'm willing to give up all this love. I'm a science teacher, so I love breaking stuff down for my kids. You know, I'm just here to be a teacher, man. Here to give a teacher and talk about some things I do to get the class engaged, man. Bring that energy. You got to bring that energy, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big up, big up, Calvin. Um, Brent Blacksmith, um, native to Michigan, um, family from Alabama, Mississippi, Clarkdale, Mississippi specifically. Um, I grew up in Rochester, Michigan, where OU is, um, and really, you know, had had a privileged life um, and and came to Detroit via uh, an engineering scholarship and uh, with Wayne State, and uh, just really haven't haven't left Wayne State since um or left detroit since and uh so i'm a detroiter of 15 years um proud northwest sider um uh, mary grove college u of d six mile livernois um and an artist and an educator and uh, a writer um i believe in like the power of uh writing um and specifically like you know soul writing or writing that comes from a higher place or from your dreams or from your nightmares um and and i'm happy to like be on with y'all um, because y'all love hip hop as much as I do. Um, and, and yeah, like, yeah, it's just like mine. Absolutely. Well, shoot, let's get into it. So, Hey, first song that, uh, I thought about, uh, this is a song that's actually on my playlist when I'm at the gym It's actually called high power by Kendrick, Lamar, uh, Kendrick Lamar. 
uh, re it was released in 2011, I believe. J. Cole was the producer, you know. Um, yeah. So outside of being a rapper, J. Cole also makes beats. Um, it was off the uh, Section 80 um, album from Kendrick Lamar. And I found it, uh, I found, you know, this song very interesting because he talks about a lot of um, uh, civil rights leaders, but he mentions uh, Martin Luther King the most. And um, I'll read like some of his lyrics, like at the uh, you know, right, right when the song starts at the beginning, he says, um, visions of Martin Luther staring at me. Malcolm X put a hex on my future. Someone catch me. I'm falling victim to a revolutionary song. Right. And that kind of sets you up for the rest of the song. That's the tone of the song. Um, the next the next time he mentions them, he says almost identical. Uh, visions of Martin Luther staring at me. If I see it how he's seen it, that will make my parents happy, right? So for me, I think that uh, as an educator, I mean, so much uh, like with this song, period, but I think it's so much that um, um, to introduce um, first of all, Martin Luther King and who he was to students because um, first of all, um, Martin Luther King's life. Uh, so let me go back to this first. When you say visions of Martin Luther King staring at me. When I when I saw that, when I think about that, I mean, uh, I think uh, look, he was maybe in his 20s. Um, Kendrick was in his 20s. Uh, what? Well, early 20s when he maybe wrote this. And I always compare when I was in the classroom, I would compare Martin Luther King to like rappers and stuff, because I mean, he started when he was 25. Right. Um, leading the Montgomery bus boycott. And so through his voice, he was able to convince whole groups of people in Montgomery, Alabama to walk <laughs> for almost a year, right? You know what I'm saying? Not get on the bus, not, you know, and it was through his his word, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, so I remember when I was in my 20s, I was like, man, what am I doing, right? You know, right. and you know, I, I would reflect on how am I using my voice? And I would, you know, again, I would compare, like, I'm like, well, he was 25, always, and I always look at, let's look at some of the ages of your, your favorite rappers. You know what I'm saying? How are they using their voices, right? Um, and then to think about, you know, when Martin Luther King got into his 30s, and then when he ultimately died at the age of 39, like, you know, whether you, whether you agree with him or not, you know, nobody can ever say that Martin Luther King did not put his all into what he believed, right? You know, he, he you know, being put in prison, uh, being beat, <laughs> um, marching, and then ultimately, you know, dying for for this cause, man. Um, mm. I think that, so when I hear Kendrick Lamar starting off, visions of Martin Luther staring at me, it's almost like, it's almost like a gut check. Like, this is what this guy did all before he turned 40. I turned 40 in September. And it was like, you know, all, all before he turned 40, he did all this stuff, left it all on the table. And it's almost like you a rapper, you using your voice. What are you using it for? You know what I'm saying? And so um, to me, that's something that, you know, that always resonated with me and something I would, you know, would as a way to introduce Martin Luther King's life. Like, look, he did this all before he was 40, starting in his 20s. If you can, if you can put his life next to like your favorite rappers, you know what I'm saying. Like, look at his, look at the age, look at what he's doing. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. and so, um, that's something that you know, you know, I would just a way to introduce Martin Luther King's life, um, and then kind of picking on Kendrick Lamar's brain. Like, why is he fixated on visions of Martin Luther staring at him? You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Staring at him because he is, is, is Martin Luther King looking as a at, like in judgment. You know, so I think about that boondock episode where uh, I don't know if you guys remember that. Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King is talking to the congregation like, "Yo, this is what you know. This is what I fought for and died for, and this is what y'all doing." You know, and so I almost look at it like, you know, is is Martin Luther King looking at him like, "Hmm, what are you doing?" Or, "Hmm, I see what you're doing." You know, so I, I think I think. <laughs> Visions. I, I'm just from a from a from a writing perspective. Mm -hmm. Visions of Martin. Luther, I I I think about him writing, and Martin Luther is looking at him write, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that as MCs, 
we all have obligations. Your obligations might be your obligation might be to the streets. It's it's really your obligation to your foundation. Like you, you may have an obligation to the streets. You may have an obligation to, um, I think the the obligation that Kendrick is speaking of is he has an obligation to use his platform to do something positive. So, you know, if you believe that somebody who ascended to the greatness and the degree of sacrifice that Kendrick did, then it's difficult. It's it's uncomfortable to write songs that's not about anything yeah, or uncomfortable yeah. to write songs that's not about. I, I mean, it's not that it's not necessarily about anything, but they don't capture the fullness of what life should be and can be. It doesn't mean that you can't make a record where you're not cussing or you're not talking about something that's scandalous, but you're able to put it in context. And I think that's what is part of what makes Kendra great is the fact that he has the ability to weave into weave through these different scenarios and situations that people encounter without passing judgment and allowing people to make their own judgments. And then again, when he says Malcolm X put a hex on my future, it's that double consciousness piece because that voice of Malcolm X is always in the background. It's always in the background of, of his dealings. So in one, in one position, you know, when you think about the, the, the difference between Martin Luther and Malcolm X, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, I should say, was interested in nonviolent solutions mm, right. society and a certain degree of um, it was almost like a permissiveness, mm. like a permission to live and be human. Whereas Malcolm was like, I'm taking it. And mm -hmm. if you exist in that consciousness, it's, it wears on you where you constantly trying to. I don't want to say prove your humanity, but you're constantly trying to get what's yours as opposed to asking somebody for it. So I think that's what was beautiful about that. Yeah. And, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. He's conflicted. I mean, he says it in the song. He says visions of Martin Luther staring at me. If I see how you feel, if I see how you see it, that would make my parents happy. And then he apologizes to his parents. He says, sorry, mama, I can tuck the under cheek. They're trying to knock yeah. me off. Yeah, like a fucking widow's peak, yeah. you know what I mean? So he's super conflicted, and I think that is the most human thing that you can say. That's why that song is so important. And the kind of reference I'll let you add to uh, finish, Quan. You know, when that song came out, I was in college, um, mm -hmm. and that's when Obama, that's when Obama got elected. So that's when I'm, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing change, right? Unfortunately, we know deep down, it's a lot more that needs to be done. So I'm like, man, this is probably going to be changed. But then we got Trayvon Martin. We got Michael Brown. And then going back to you saying, I'm like, I'm conflicted with two consciousness. I'm like, yeah. I want to get education and live my life. But then they killing us on the street. Mm. I'm going to fight. Yep. You know? And I love that song. And that was the first song that was the most, that showed the most empathy to that double consciousness concept that you talk about in the most, in the most simplistic Musical, catchy way, man. Right. I, I I agree wholeheartedly. I would say the rival, you know, high high power. I would say Mortal Man um, on on Pimp a Butterfly when when Pop is talking to him, you know, and he says, you know, you don't see somebody over thirty, you know, mad and spazzing out on you know society. I'm paraphrasing, but like to me, that also matched that double consciousness about like you know the ground um and how the ground will eat and swallow the rich and the wealthy um and so i just you know i'm, I'm, I'm with i'm with with rod like when it comes to like this i don't know like this obligation to tell tell this story um mm -hmm. that we don't tell a lot right since maybe like souls of black folks um mm -hmm. yeah. by wb du bois so i think yeah. kendrick is bringing a lot of literary concepts into this um because he has the knowledge, right? And so we as people, we, we want to share knowledge, we want to share information. I feel like you know this that 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 message is 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 very important to share. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and I think you talk like the, the conflicted part too. I think um to add to the conflict is like <clears throat> when we think about like racism in America, we think like um we gotta react like um, like Malcolm, or like how Malcolm said, we go now. Malcolm never did anything violent to anybody. Well, 
you know, as a um, as a leader, he never did anything violent to anybody, you know, or, or asked you to do something violent. But he said, yo, this is something that this is a tool that we can use, though. We can have mm-hmm. this building mm-hmm. nature. We got to defend ourselves. Right. Um, and so when it comes to if someone outside of our race comes in and, and tries to do something to us, we, we have to defend our, our home. We have to defend ourselves. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, Martin was like, well, there's there has to be a way that we can resolve conflict without stu- without violence, without killing each other. Right. And so. So that's that's um, interracial, but like interracial, though, I think, you know, like being in school, we talk about um, restorative practices and things like that. And that's the harder restorative practices is, is the Kingian nonviolence concept where I, I confront you about the action. But I want to resolve what's going on. I don't hate you, but I want to resolve the conflict right. without, you know, resulting to violence or resulting to a chasm where we can't we can't never see eye to eye. And so I go back to um, Kendrick Lamar. I think he brings this up again in in um, the Black of the Berry. Mm-hmm. He talks mm-hmm. about the middle. This is like right after Ferguson. He called a lot of flack for this because at the end he says, you know. I cried when Trayvon Martin was in the street, but Game Bang caused me to kill a black man. You know and so, but I think then we can interject like, all right, visions of Martin Luther stand at me. If I see it how he's seen it, it will make my parents happy. Like he talks about this mm. a lot. Like you know, being uh, I think about that song. Um, uh, it's two songs together uh, on Pimple Butterfly, Sing About Me, and Down the Thirst. Good kid, man. Sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good kid, man. Yeah, the, the right. Don the Thirst, and he talked, huh? Right, 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 right. I'm listening to. Yeah, he talked Don the Thirst, and he and he's going to kill somebody, right? And the woman stops him. You know what I'm saying? To me, that represents what he's saying with his mama. If I saw how my mama seen it, you know what I'm saying? So, and I think that speaks to like a lot of, you know, just in school, it's like, look, you know, when we go out to, um, you know, like I say, this whole conflict. You know that that um, that um, Kendrick Lamar is having. Um, it's a conflict that we have not only interracial but within our race. We had that conflict. Like you know, how do I treat somebody that looks like me? You know what I'm saying? Do I treat them with um, a Kenyan nonviolence approach? You know what I'm saying? Where I'm like, hey, you know, we we in the same school, we in the same class, we you know what I'm saying? We learning the same thing. You know, do I feel like I need to knock your head off at lunchtime? You know what I'm saying? Or is you know can we follow these steps you know what i'm saying and yeah. as Kendrick lamar grows and you see him say this verse in 2011 and then when he uh uh we call mortal man um well uh good sit good kid mad city with um black of the berry and then you know mortal man you know we if we see it all come it all comes from you know full circles like well treating human beings a certain way you know um not only is it something that, you know, like Martin Luther King, like I can take these lessons and use them within my own life with people in my direct vicinity, people that's close to me. They don't necessarily have to be somebody that's, you know, on TV. Cause like on that, on that video with high power, he shows uh, like political pundits and Fox news broadcasters, you know, he's calling them racist. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so it don't have to be the racist on TV. It don't have to be, you know, yeah. Uh, the people at the Capitol, storming the Capitol, you know what I'm saying? It could be somebody, you know, I would say with the kids in your own classroom, you know what I'm saying, that you can right. with. And it, it takes on a different feeling then where it's like, well, you know, maybe I can look into this. And so I think that, you know, I think that's that's his conflict, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. um, with that whole high power um, uh, philosophy, it was to bring up, you know, because in hip hop, you know, sometimes you can get a lot of uh, gun talk, a lot of violence talk, negotiating violence in a clever way. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah. as a, as a rapper, he's like, yo, do I have to do that? You know what I'm saying? Do I have to negotiate violence in a clever way, or can I talk about this conflict I have with negotiating violence? You know what I'm saying? With Martin Luther King looking at me, with Malcolm X looking at me. He mentions wow. Fred Hampton too. And one one thing I'll say is that all those people were young. Fred Hampton being the youngest when they died. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, right. Right. But, they, but they did a whole bunch, of, <clears throat> a whole bunch of things for their culture and for their community before they died. So Fred Hampton, being the youngest, he had to get it in before the age of twenty-one. So he was still in high right. school getting it in, you know. And um, and so yeah, so that you know, that's why I think it's it's 
uh, it brings it brings it full circle. You can kind of like a lot of our kids, they they only know um, the I have a dream speech. But oh. like Kendrick Lamar, I mean, Martin Luther King, he got I mean, he was in it since he was 25. You know what I'm saying? Oh. I mean, Stage is 25, got at 39. That's a whole lot of growth, a whole lot of theories and philosophy that's going on in his head that he spoke about. And I think like one of the last speeches he gave, I thought it was very important. He gave it to some middle schoolers in Philadelphia, man. It's called mm. the Blueprint. And you know, it's called the what? I'm sorry. It's called the uh, uh, Life's Blueprint. Life's Blueprint. Martin Luther King. So as a, this is in uh, this is the year before he died. So I think he was like 38 when he gave it. And I think about myself at 38 when I was, you know, mm. teaching. Stuff like that, and I'm like, he gave he was giving them, he was dropping them knowledge, uh, he's dropping knowledge on these kids, and um, and um, and he's dropping gems that's still probably that's still important for the day, but we never hear that speech, right? You know, what I'm saying? and I think that especially during you know this whole Martin Luther King thing, we're dealing with our students, like, yo, let them hear a speech where he was talking to kids at you know at their age in the 60s and see how prevalent it is today, everything he was saying then how it's still important today, the things that he was saying, so. Um, you said what? Martin Luther King was a middle child. He was he was like stuck in between two generations. He was able to relate mm. to younger mm. people and really relate to older people. And that's what Kendrick Lamar, that's what J. Cole, that's what Wale, Big Crit, that whole right. boom bap right. trap, I can rap about conscious stuff, but still keep it funky and get a pop rap pop song out of you you know what i'm saying that's what martin Luther king was that yeah. absolutely absolutely and I, I guess what makes kendrick lamar brilliant as a writer is he's a study in conflict so the conflict that you're talking about he always toys with these lines you know like that last verse in the black or the berry he's talking about all these things that he could do um you know uh, this this we live in this double consciousness so he has all of these symbols of being black or being a progressive black person that he engages in, be it talking, you know, talking about Marcus Garvey and, um, you know, talking about, you know, the Black Panthers and, and understanding their th ideology and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, has he done things to harm black men as well? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a conflict that we all live with. And I think it's a conflict that we live with as educators as well, mm. because, you know, since, I've kind of left the fray for a couple of years. I think about all of the great things that I've done to impact the lives of young people. Um, but also there were some decisions I made that destroyed black men mm -hmm. or that had the capacity to destroy black men. So I understand where he's coming from as a storyteller, being in a position where he's just expressing the dichotomy that makes every person. Yeah. So you know, that toy between between King and Malcolm X is just par for the course for him. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Martin Luther King's um, interpretation and his reality is presented in two different ways. The way that Martin Luther King is presented is just, I have a dream and then he died and that was it. But people yeah. never talk about how his approval rating amongst white supporters was, was completely terrible you know like he was literally getting publicly exiled before his death and it was really because he was a provocateur and he was right. saying in his speech he was trying to speak for the the poor people and when you're speaking for the poor people you're not only speaking to the black constituents but you're speaking to those white constituents that you're manipulating to be on your ticket but you know deep down your political motives are not going to benefit them and this this brother these initiatives that he's putting together, these this quote unquote mm. socialism, you know what I'm mm. saying? He's talking about stuff that we're still talking about now. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to keep going back to it, you know, Martin Luther King was a born sinner. You know what I'm saying? He he was he was uh what J. Cole said and she knows. I feel like <laughs> he said, uh, this is Martin Luther King in the club getting dubbed. Right. The bad chick right. in the club, and it's down for whatever. When the back in his mind is Coretta, you know, like just that middle child concept. Mm. I, I love to point that out because if you're a middle child, you are a rap intellect, you are a trap intellect, you are a ratchetemic, you are, you know, you're educated, but you can break it down. And Kendrick Lamar, all those people, they're just, just examples of that, man. Definitely examples of that, man. 
on a, on a different level, do you think that, do you guys think that King, um, when looking through the history of hip hop, do you think that King is looked at as less than, than Malcolm, than, than Malcolm X? Less than Malcolm X? I think it goes to that, that, that American, uh, perspective right um this this united states you know what we what we get in our history books perspective mm -hmm. so you don't really hear you know malcolm x's story unless you you know read, read alex haley or you watch interviews with you know malcolm's family or you watch that latest docu documentary on netflix mm -hmm. you know where somebody is actually you know telling the true story and bringing you know that truth uh to light Right. Um, I think with Martin, you know, there's a little bit more. Yeah, there's just a little bit more fluff. Right. But like 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 Calvin was saying, there's, um, you know, speeches against, you know, the Vietnam War, you know, and that's yeah. that's that's going after a major military power. Um, so both of those men's lives were, you know, were were, were threatened. Um, and, and I feel like I don't know, I can't. I can't say, you know, we, we lift one one up and we put one down. You know, I just think, you know, we have to see them, you know, as 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 giants of their own. And like, um, you know, kind of like the the Jordan LeBron conversation or the Kobe, yeah. you know, that you I mean, we got to lift both up. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I, I, I think that, um, you know, looking at those ages, that they were, man. Like, I'm just saying, yo, starting college at 15, <laughs> you know, 25 when you become a leader of a movement, 39 when you die. Like, he lived a short life, you know what I'm saying? Um, but he did so much. And, you know, and when I compare, like, you know, how old was Wayne when he started rapping? You mm. know what I'm saying? The same temptations that Wayne had was the same temptations that King had. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, of course, different time periods, but you know, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm getting at. But I think that one of the things about King that, like, we just again, we just and this and it's kind of like the the um the problem with sanitizing history is like you know we only get the I have a dream speech from him, you know what I'm saying, and we don't get the commentary from what other people said. Like you know, Stokely Carmichael, he said out of all the civil rights leaders, he respected King the most. Right. And the reason why he said he respected King, not because of his ideologies, he said because King was real. He said, he said, whatever King, whatever way King was in front of you was the way he was behind your back. Mm -hmm. He never talked about nobody behind their back. He uh, same way he was, you know, and we talk about being real and, and hip hop. That's probably the most used word. Authentic. You know, uh, you know authentic, all that stuff like that. Like, and they said, and here it is, Stoli Carmichael, somebody who had a totally different ideology, said, I respected this guy the most. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and then you know him giving those basically saying you know, he was just a real dude. You know, so I think that um, and that's one of the jobs of teachers is kind of rescue um, some of our leaders from um, what history doesn't doesn't um, tell us. You know, I think I think that as teachers, you know, we sort of exist within this pressure where we are the moral center of the community to a degree. Mm -hmm. The expectation of us knowing that we have students who are watching the manner in which we govern ourselves, not only physically, but also online sometimes, yeah, um, gives us pause in doing some of the things. I, I mean, I put it the same as being a preacher. Mm -hmm. the, you know what I'm saying? I think both of us are, are summarily governed by certain rules, maybe a preacher to another degree, but I think sometimes it's a degree of capital that's involved with preachers that can tend to corrupt sometimes. But mm -hmm. um, you know, being able to walk the walk and talk to talk is something that King had. And I think it's something that's incumbent on not only us as teachers, but it's a quality that we are supposed to share with MCs as well. Yeah. MCs have to do the same thing. They have to be who they are. And um, it requires us kind of consciously put up some parameters if that's not something that you're you're comfortable showing to everybody. Um, and I think as an MC, I, I'm, I just look at one of, one of my targets for this year is. The fact that I don't have to be one thing, mm. you know, I put an album out last week and I'm cussing on the album. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And before then, it was incomprehensible when I was working in a school that if I was rapping and I wasn't rapping or anything, I never put a tape out when I was in a school. 
But when I was, it would be incomprehensible for me to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even able to really speak to the fact that, yes, I have this professional academic experience, but I'm also a hip hop artist or a hip hop producer. And this is what I do and be able to kind of conjoin those. I couldn't do that until I left K-12 mm. with faith in myself and, and without any self-doubt. So, sure. um, yeah, there is a lot. of. I think that in, in America, we tend to focus on, you know, what somebody specifically contributes to the mainstream set of ideas that being I have a dream speech and therefore you're not going to get to focus on some of the other things that King did. But yeah. I think that's a quality that King shared, you know, with us as black men, we have to, you know, there are great things that we do for everybody. And then there are things that we do specifically to serve the needs of our people. Let's keep it a book. Right. And, you know, and I want to, you know, I want to point this out too, that people like King, Malcolm, uh, the Panthers, like they had, these were the, the intellectuals um who who had a great influence on the entertainment uh, industry <laughs> you know what i'm saying like right. um what do you mean so like so for instance to me james brown is like you know he was like how we call uh, we talk about mumble rap you know um you couldn't understand what he was saying, but it was so the music was so good. The band was so good. It was so so harmonious. The melody, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you know, but even somebody like James Brown had to make I'm black and I'm proud, the big payback. He was a part of the music. He couldn't he couldn't live in that era without doing that. The pressure was on by the people, the leaders of the civil rights movement, like, yo, you gotta do this. Um Revenge. Muhammad Ali, you know what I'm saying? Jim Brown, for them to, I think uh Regina King has uh Sam Cook. She um uh, uh, the, I forget the name of the. Is it One Night in Miami or something like that? The um, the the, um, the movie, the film, yeah, the movie. But like you know, just the story with Sam Cooke. Like Sam Cooke was the was a pop artist, mm -hmm. but he was like, I think he said he went and uh, he made that song "Change Gonna Come" because he's like, yo, you had people like Bob Dylan. I think he heard Bob Dylan uh, blowing in the wind. He was like, I should have made that song. You know mm. what I'm saying? And so. He's like, so he had to make a, a, a relevant song for the times. Um, Martin Luther King, uh, I don't know if anybody, anybody here watch Star Trek? I used yeah. to. Okay, I, I always hated Star Trek. <laughs> Star Trek was, uh, I never liked it, but uh, but the story is, is that um, Michelle Nichols, I think she she played um, Yahuru. Yeah. The original Star Trek. She was about to quit. And she actually ended up running into um, King and King was like, look, you can't quit. Like, yep. you know, this is the only show that I allow my um, my children to watch because it displays black people in a positive way. You know what I'm saying? So so what you see is that you have an, you have an agenda um, and you have these intellectuals that's pressuring the entertainers to be like, look, you got to if you black, you got to get a, you got to get aboard with this. You know, or or I don't know what the or was <laughs> or what, but the fact that these these entertainers are like, all right, we we got you, we gonna we gonna get aboard on what you're doing, you know. So I think that shows just how much pull, like that that era, that '60s, and you know that they had, you know, and you know, and maybe a blueprint that we can, you know, even follow today because right now I think it's a little different. I think that the entertainers are kind of uh, really setting the tone for the culture. So, yeah, you 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 right on. You right on because it's yeah. Like where where do we see that type of um, contribution now? Like besides you know um, some of our more like vocal women, right? Like Stacey Abrams being yeah, yeah. Uh, trending yeah. right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where are we getting where are we getting that affirmation from? To organize and to you know lift one another up without hearing it from like doc, doc rivers at a press conference yeah. you know um where he's you know basically uh upset about a country that doesn't like him right or doesn't even like the idea of his biracial mix in a racial family or doesn't like the fact that you know he plays for an organization that had a racist uh uh owner you know 
uh, Doc, Doc, Doc Sterling or whatever his name is, right? Like, I feel like yeah. you know, when it comes to Donald, Donald Sterling, yeah. Yeah, Donald Sterling. So when it comes to, like, entertainment and sports, like, yeah, we see a lot of that race. We see a lot of that talk in the big field of, like, you know, advertisements and commercials. And I remember when everything mattered, you know, you know, Black Lives Mattered first, you, you know, almost 10 years ago, right? But you saw it in like, you know, Nissan commercials, Speed Matters, you know, and, and it's like these messages or these, this text that, you know, starts with like bringing truth to power or starts with like, uh, a qualitative research paper or starts with like somebody identifying a problem in a community and then like doing something about it and not this like I don't know like this packaged um t-shirt uh yeah you know revolution it's, yeah, it's, yeah. A hashtag so, revolution yeah well, so when you speak of that era like I knew exactly what you were talking mm -hmm. about like yeah mm -hmm. we're in a different time now and it's it is social media led um meme led but like yeah I don't know yeah I'm hopeful but it's 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 gonna take a, a heavy lift um, to really, really recenter people to hear, hear, hear real messages. Like I feel like you know when it comes to hip hop, um, it it wasn't easy to figure out what songs to attach to King. You know, there isn't like a King, a MLK song that you know, I don't know, uh, I don't. It's taken from his from his speeches, right? Or words taken directly from the title of his speeches. Like, I think there's a lot of work to do um, in that regard. Like being able to synthesize what King was talking about and to put it onto record. Yeah, man. Y'all talking about some cool stuff, man. Man, I, man, it's all about hip hop, man. And what, what I mean, Kendrick Lamar, he, he's always self-evaluating himself and he's always calling himself out. He's like, he'll call himself a hypocrite. And I think his world is lacking leaders. And the, the, the kryptonite to a leader is being a hypocrite. You're not a leader right. if you're a hypocrite, right? Right. And if you're right. a hip hop artist, right? You got to remember that hip hop is to liberate. And if yeah. you, you want to liberate, you got to be part of the liberation movement. <laughs> you know, and if, if you ain't part of the liberation movement, then why are you really doing this hip hop stuff? Are you doing it for the people? Or are you doing it for the individual? You know, and so I think that's why you saw people protesting Kendrick Lamar. Almost every rapper who say they, you know, they successful, they were protesting because they want people to know, like, you know, we 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 love to make money, but hip hop culture is bigger than the uh, materialism. There you are. I'm not sure where. Um his like the high power was an actual philosophy. I'm not sure what where things are with the high power movement, but uh it's spelled H I I I and then power. And so Kendrick Lamar says those three I's stands for heart, honor, and respect. You know, so um, you know, and and he would, you know, he would you know at his uh, concerts, he would have people put the three fingers in the air and you know, and he says it on the song as well. So, like, I'm not sure exactly, you know, uh, where it's at and it's something he still advocates for. But one of the things I will say is that I think that we are in similar times as the 60s. And, and this is what I mean. Um, well, maybe we're not at those similar times now, but I think that this new this new uh, decade is similar to what went on from the 50s going into the 60s. Um, one of the things you talk about our students, man. Like our students have consecutive, 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 consecutively seen, you know, starting with Trayvon Martin, you know, to yeah. you know, uh, everything that came after Trayvon Martin, to what went on in the summer with George Floyd and things like that. Students, young people, have to process that, and they're seeing this, and like, man, they're they're young, they're teenagers. But they're going to come of age in this new decade. And that's the same thing that happened with the Emmett Till generation of the 50s. The Emmett Till generation, Emmett Till was 14 himself. So in the 60s, they came of age. They went to college. They were put in positions where they could do something. And so um, I'm almost interested in seeing, like, what will happen, what's going to happen in this new decade with these students, man. Like, are, you know, students that I've taught, that, you know, that you, you know, that you taught that are growing up with this. And now when they come of age, 
they can do something about it, you know. And I think that's why the 60s was so popular. I mean, it was so powerful is that you had those young people in the 50s who saw the gruesome murder of a 14 year old, you know, that was put, you know, Jet Magazine, colors all over the world. And they did say, it's like, man, they, they saw that and they did something about it, you know. And so I'm just, you know, but I, I would just say, just, just, but just continue to believe in the fact that black people have never been a monolith. That wasn't everybody. Yeah. A lot of black people that just continued to work and continue to just abide by Indeed. the rules. And I Indeed. think that that's something that we have to keep in mind when we believe that people are not just like when we talked about King at the beginning, King, even amongst black people that's right. the time of his death was right. not necessarily held consistently always in the highest regard because there was the burgeoning talk from the other side of the fence that said, you know, we've tried to do things this way and it's gotten us to this part, to this place, but the fight is not over. So, I think we just have to continue to be diligent um, as right. people who want to be change agents to recognize that everybody is not intended to get it. Everybody is not intended to have the stamina or the interest in maintaining that degree of service. Um, and I, I, you know, I was thinking further about when, when you talked about how you were thinking about songs where King specifically was targeted as part of the message, you know, like they show clips and things. I think when you really think about King, as opposed to how he was used from an audio perspective, I think that King ushered in this or not not necessarily ushered in, but this Messiah complex that African yeah. Americans developed in the mid 20th century or before yep. that said that there was going to be one person like a Moses, yeah. a person that was going to lead people to the promised land. And we began to continue to look through hip hop when hip hop became culturally separated to a degree from the rest of society, we was always looking to hip hop to find that Moses. And for many of us, we thought that Moses was Tupac mm -hmm. as conflicted as Tupac was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think even um, the manner in which sometimes we view celebrity and the manner in which we view a uh, black celebrity, the manner in which we view, um, you know, men of charisma in our communities. It has a lot to do with King. A lot to do with King. Um, I remember growing up that right next to the picture, when I would go to church, right next to the picture of white Jesus was a picture of Dr. King. Mm -hmm. So when you hold them both in that higher regard, that's what you were saying to be. Mm -hmm. And all of us probably in here was in the school play in elementary school and we had to read I Have a Dream. We all will yes, say Yes, I, know I, I know I had to do it in fifth grade. You know what I'm saying? So the impact is there and, and we just have to we, we just have to keep in mind that I mean, it, it just reminds me to keep my nose to the grindstone. Everybody ain't gonna feel you but you, you stick to what you're supposed to be doing. Basically you're saying King is in everybody's top three. That's what you're saying. King was an MC. Was King not an MC? No, I would say. <laughs> King and everybody top three always. That's the Jay Z to everybody. That's the rap you do that. Jay Z got to be for it. MCN was born of the church, amongst other things. Yeah, straight up. Yeah, Absolutely. Malcolm. Yeah, Malcolm. Yeah, wow. I mean the Panthers. I mean Brad Hampton. Man, I mean Stokely Carmichael, Rap Brown. Absolutely, Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory. Paul Robeson. Paul I think I think um would it I think one of the things it does teach I mean especially like again I would encourage people to listen to that blueprint life's blueprint speech that King had and um I think one of the things that we can get from from their lives is that if you got the ear of a massive amount of people like what do you want to say you know what I'm saying like what is you know and I think and I think that's the message that the entertainers received at that time. Like you got the ear of the masses of the people right now. You're in the middle of a of a cultural revolution. So what are you going to say? And so as you, you know, when you see with the music, like even from the most, you know, Motown, the most pop uh, label it was at the time, they had to put out culturally relevant music because it's like, yo, we got the ear of everybody, and. You know, our leaders are saying, what are you going to talk about? You know what I'm saying? And so um, I think that that message 
it's still relevant today. Like, listen, if you got the ear, I'm not saying that everybody got to, you know, be a conscious or something, whatever, but it's like, if, if in our past, the most pop music, the most pop entertainers ever had to say, all right, we're going to still do that pop stuff, but we got to address this issue. You know what I'm saying? You know, whether it's through my music or through my interview or whatever, you know, it's like you got to show that you know what's going on, um, that you do have some political. Like, you got some skin in the game because you are black. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, something has to be be said or done because you have responsibility because you have the ear, you have the minds, you have the hearts of yeah. a massive amount of people. I, th I think that's the, that's the thing with teachers too, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Even if you go back to soul music, especially soul music of the 70s, um, all the way up through the 80s, and especially in the early days of rap, like the 80, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the early days of commercialized hip hop or commercialized rap music from I would say 85 to 89, we're really later, like 85 to like 91, there was always a conscious record on every project. On Raising Hell, it was Proud to be Black. On It's a Big Daddy Thing, it was Young Gifted and Black. On The Chronic, which is considered one of the most seminal negative albums of all time, you had Lil Ghetto Boy. You had The Day the N-Words took over. You know what I'm saying? So, it's 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 interesting how Dr. King, Malcolm X, the impact of their messages always find a way to engage we, we as artists, we always find a way to engage that as part of our our our, our psyche. <laughs> and some people allow it to permeate everything they create. And other people don't. Other people just kind of allow it to just kind of blossom as it does. But um, it just goes to show that it's a lot deeper than rap. It's a lot deeper than rap in terms of what they, in terms of what they did. I think that from a philosophy standpoint, um, they both had a very significant effect on us. And they both got killed. And despite yeah. them having different philosophies and people thinking that one philosophy is going to work, they both got killed. So that goes to show you that we need both. You know what I'm saying? Both. Yeah. We need it. Both we need to know when to pick our battles, and we need to know when to pick up the you know the fighting and to start fighting. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that that's a lot less stressful than feeling like you have to be one thing. Um, and I'm gonna keep going back to Section 80 because you brought it up, Quan. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you remember uh, GLC on uh, Poor Man's Dream on the yeah. end. He's talking about stay away from isms. You know, like Jamaica and Rastafari, they 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 don't believe in isms, right? Like mm -hmm. socialism, communism, like all these groups that separate us to get you confused. And if I call you that one name, then I already know everything about you. So you therefore you're a monolith, right? Identity yeah. politics, that's the word for it now. Yeah. That shit don't exist. You know what I'm saying? Like you can be a conservative Democrat, you could be a progressive Republican, right? We are way more deep than that and as artists right like you said my say you can't put me in a box you can't put yeah. me in a box right you can't put yeah. black in a box you know right. what i'm saying and, right. and liberation is very comprehensive and we're going to achieve it in many different ways yeah mm -hmm. and i just want to say too just to real quick like it's strategic it's 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 yeah. when you, when you when you call out a military power you know what i mean it's strategic uh uh, uh it's, a, it's a reaction to that right and so there was you know discourse that was created you know by fbi agents and cointel pro and you know edgar hoover and um and just just a whole uh uh like investigative um hey, Google, take stop. down, take down mm -hmm. uh, of these men um mm -hmm. so these are the these are the power structures that uh, we face and like, you know, we might not be at war, but like, yeah, like Kendrick has this conflict. Um, you know, artists have this conflict uh, because we are at, we are at war. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to leave y'all. Y'all cool with it. Move on to another song. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are, uh, Good. So this, this, <laughs> So that, I mean, we can bounce. We can always bounce back, you know, all that stuff too. But uh, I wanted to bring up this song. I thought this was very, very interesting. Um, there was a song that came out. Uh, see, I didn't. I gotta look and see what year this came out. 
Um, it was a song called You Make Me Better by Neo featuring Fabulous. Y'all remember that? Yeah. I'm a movement by myself. Mm -hmm. I'm a horseman. Mm -hmm. Hey, so at the end of that first verse, um, he he uh, so the song is about um, in the artist's opinion that a compatible woman will make their endeavors and ultimately themselves better, right? And so at the end, he gives a nod to Coretta, Coretta Scott King. She said, he says. I'm going to need Coretta Scott if I'm going to be king, right? And I just thought that was interesting because, um, you know, the song You Make Me Better, and I'm thinking about the civil rights movement. If the civil rights movement, you know, and I'm, I'm going to read, let me read a quote from Coretta Scott, Quint, Coretta Scott King real quick. Uh, she says that uh, in a 1966 um, interview in, in New Lady magazine, she says, not enough attention has been focused on the roles played by women in the struggle. By and large, men have formed the leadership in the civil rights struggle, but women have been the backbone of the whole civil rights movement. As always. As yeah. always. As in, as in all things. Yeah. As in all things. And, yeah, and so, yeah, and so I just like, you know, just that little bit of, you know, that little blurb saying, I'm going to need Coretta Scott if I'm going to be king. Um, so, you know, I, that, that made me interested in, like, how was Coretta Scott the backbone for Martin Luther King, you know? And then that brings up a big, bigger thing with her interview. Like, how was how have women – I mean, we hear about the men because, like, you know, they'll put them out in front. But how have men – how have women um, – Contributed contributed to the civil rights movement, and just looking at that, like man, if, if I could, so much we don't we don't teach about what mm -hmm. women have done. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, if, if I could, just real quick, I just whenever I think about Coretta Scott King, I think about that seminal image of her at King's funeral, mm -hmm. and in uh, you in her face, you can see that she acknowledged and signed up for. Mm -hmm. the risk with which her husband lived mm -hmm. and you don't know what happened internally she might have had a great deal of you know pushback to him like don't do that they're gonna do this they're gonna but she not and and when i think about that image i just think about the resilience of black women yeah. period mm -hmm. um you know, yeah. I don't know the degree to which I don't know the degree to which she she was involved in how, you know, the 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 legacy of King was secured in terms of the center and this that, and the third. I know that she was, you know, a maternal figure and all of those things while her kids did this, you know, did that work or whatever. Yeah. But I just think about that image always, and I think about how she acknowledged the fact that she knew it was deeper than here. It was deeper than being here. Him doing what he had to do was was deeper than him being on this plane because he wasn't doing it just for this plane of existence. Yeah. And so that's that's what I think about when I think about her. Yeah. And I think that as far as, you know, dealing with students, it's like it's just it just helps. To, I mean, just that little blurb helps to usher in like, you know, let's look at women in the civil rights movement. I mean, Coretta Scott, before she even was married to Martin Luther King, she was involved in the civil rights movement and she was persecuted because of that. I mean, she went to. Uh, school in Ohio, man, and she was a part of the NAACP chapter at her school. Uh, she was active, um, and she was persecuted before uh, because of it. They went, you know, she was going to be an educator. Um, they they didn't allow her to 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 take her exam or to be certified to be a teacher because of her involvement in NAACP. So she was, you know, sacrificing and feeling the persecution before she even got with Martin Luther King. Um, I mean, while she was with Martin Luther King. You know, if he was speaking somewhere else, I mean, there's been cases where she would go and take up speaking engagements that he couldn't make. Like he would, and she would go and speak, and and, and she would be a draw because of who she was. She yeah. fought for um, you know, women's um, rights as well. Um, after uh, Martin Luther King passed, she was instrumental in MLK Day becoming a federal recognized holiday. It was her work. Um, after spending time in South Africa, she you know she. She spoke with Winnie Mandela. She had a relationship with her. 
she came oh. back and you know had conversations with the White House about that. Oh, we need to put on, we need to put sanctions against South Africa because it's our apartheid thing. Uh, Ooh. the Civil Rights Act of 1864, she was instrumental in and working with that as well. So it's like she has a, a very story history. And I, I know I'm not getting all of it, you know, out there, but the point is that she, um, like the song said, not only did she make Martin Luther King better, she made the civil rights movement better. And it's the same thing with women, period. Like I think about, I learned about Ella Jo Baker um, as a college student, man. I was upset I didn't know about her before that, but, uh, but it wouldn't be a civil rights movement. It wouldn't be marches if it wasn't for Ella Jo Baker. You know, yeah. um, you know, just uh, you know, just reaching back into the past, the red record, the Ida B. Wells, Sojourner Truth. She, it was in part she stood up. She felt the wrath of other uh, uh, white women who were in, involved in women's rights because she stood up to say, you know what, I'm all for women's rights. But when it came down to the right to vote, when black men had the opportunity to get the right to vote, she's like, yo, I'm standing up for my black men to get the right to vote. And she, right. You know what I'm saying? And she right. got a lot of flack for that, but that was black women holding us down. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and, and if I get in, like, that's 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 what it is. Like, I think of Fannie Lou Hamer, like, mm -hmm. you know, showing up at the Democratic convention and, and you know, white media saying, like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna put her on television because, you know, she's not what we want the Democratic Party to be. Mm -hmm. However, she had organized, uh, you know, her hood um, and she had organized her family to get out and vote, um, and, and and despite not being televised, uh, mm -hmm. she still gave her speech, um, unmoved, unbothered, but knowing that you know it needed to be said. Um, and so I, I just think you know when it comes to movement building, I mean women show up. You know, um, Quan, you know, in demand. You know, uh, as an organizer, you trying to bring men together um, is challenging. Um, when we when we try to you you know get on the same page you know wh whether it be mood whether it be ego whether it be whatever but it seems like to me when you look at the polls when you look at schools when you look at who's taking care of the household it's it's women that show up and uh, I just you know um, it's important that we we be consistent and uh, yeah I feel like we we sometimes slip slip in and out like we we there you know we hard we in front. You know, we give them the speech, we putting it down, and then we disappear or we're gone um, or we're not present. Uh, and so I, I just think when it comes to that type of uh, thought, like, yeah, it's it's it's, it's women that, that kind of kind of kill that um, mm -hmm. and do it well. And, and I can appreciate this song, man. Like, I remember when it first came out, of course, it was a, a pop hit, whatever. But I think just listening to the words, I mean. I'm a movement by myself, but I'm a force when we're together, you know, not an adversarial relationship, not, you know, my baby mama drama, but saying like, yo, when we work together, you know, separate, you know, we yeah. good, you know, but when we work together, yeah, you know, we, nothing can stop us, you know. It's, it's the cool, it's the cool, man. It's the cool factor. Like Fab at that time, you yeah. know, was like promoting the cool, like this is, this is somebody who's holding me down and I'm holding her down. Right. Yeah. Um, and we we like how we like how that sounds. We like how Fab is smooth and laid back, right? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I because re I remember when that song came out, and I was like, that's what I want, right? Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, that was the cool. That was the ultimate cool then. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and it don't and like you know and as I think about you know the civil rights movement, it don't have to be a romantic relationship. It can just be like, yo, we we're trying to you know in demand like you know uh, shouts out to Nina Payne. I yep. shout out to my wife, Courtney Nellums, like, yo, we wouldn't have, like, I mean, a, a lot of stuff, you know, as far as with the planning and, and executing things, because, you know, although it's a movement to get men to get involved, right. best believe women are all all on this, man. You know what I'm saying? They support us. They, uh, they help do the, do the planning. They, you know, they they rock, man. You know, shout out to Stacey Abrams. We just talked about Stacey Abrams as well. It's that whole thing, you know, where you get you get Joe Biden who gets up and say, thank you, black women. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, that, and, that's, and that's the that's the truth. And I think that when you talk the civil rights movement, like, you know, we haven't done a good job uh, in history of really, like, you know, like, yo, women, this is what they did. This is the role they played. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we we hear, we know Martin Luther King. We know Malcolm X. We know 
the the uh the pandas, you know what I'm saying? Uh the all the male, you know, is definitely male cent centered. But um listening to that song, it's like I always I thought about like, man, that's an excellent way to introduce the important women, the importance of women in the civil rights movement. My wife brought up that uh 75% of the the participants in like a lot of the boycotts were like women, you know what I'm saying? Like the marches and the demonstrations in the 60s, they were women because you know, what we know is that if it was too many black men out there, they was going to kill them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, as a strategic uh, point, they was like, well, let's put some women out there as well. So, it's absolutely. A really, it's a really good book. And I'm just going to give this reference, Mr. Wallace. Uh, mm -hmm. By uh, Eleanor Brown, A Taste of Power by Eleanor Brown. Eleanor Brown, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her first name wrong, but she was uh, married to a Huey P. Newton and she mm -hmm. took over the Black Panther Party pretty much when he was in jail. And that book pretty much talks about, you know, despite, you know, the Black Panther Party being very pro-Black, very, you know, everything that we want, there was still patriarchy, you know, mm -hmm. there was still misogyny, you know, there was still that dynamic that is a function of white supremacy in the Black Panther Party, you know? Um, and obviously, because we're, we're, we're imperfect, you know what I'm saying? And and that, that's gonna happen, you know, but definitely, you know, you gotta see through, that's why diversity is so important. That's why you gotta hear different people's perspective on certain topics and always ask for an expert point of view. If you are not an expert, don't let that King's disease take your, you know, or that ego take control and think that just because you got a lot of bravado, a lot of power, you know, your logic can't fall victim to stupidity. You know? mm. Wow. Wow. I, think, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I just think about ourselves. We all actively contribute in a way and we wouldn't be able to do it without the women in our lives. Mm -hmm. And not even from a passive perspective, but from you know when you think about the lyric we're completed you know we're 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 completed because we're imperfect as men right. we're naturally imperfect and as women they're naturally imperfect to a degree so that completion cre can create the mission right. and i think that you know you think about when the the bus boycott occurred in um birmingham um you know, I've been really learning about the value of marketing. And there was a woman, I got to double check her name. There was a woman specifically. And we're talking about 1955, right? 1955. Yep. They distributed 50,000 flyers for this bus boycott. Mm. We're not talking about going to Kinko's. Right. You know, <laughs> and running them. You know what I'm saying? It, I don't know the specific process, but. It might have been like them early days of like making dittos or whatever, mm -hmm. but it was a woman who engineered that process and not even from a very mechanical perspective. It's just doing the work that got to be done. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just doing what has to be done. And like I said, the women in our lives do the work that has to be done as well. You know, sometimes we can be very visionary. Mm -hmm. And I know for me in, in, in giving honor to, to my wife, mm -hmm. um, the fact that she's extremely detail oriented catches everything I miss. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. And it's just, it's absolutely essential. So um, yeah, you're right. We will be remiss. And I think that we do need to do a better job of honoring. Um, I think we do need to, uh, to do a better job of not only honoring women from our history, but honoring women on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Um, because still, even our focus, you know, even our focus on the need for African American male teachers um, disregards. I, I don't, it disregards the fact that we need teachers of substance of all types yeah. who are African American and who grew up in the neighborhoods that our kids did. Yeah. Um, the 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 problem is that there's so little of a group of men who are doing it that there's a there's a there's considered to be an additional value there. So yeah. yeah. That's just but we, but we also gotta, we also gotta, you know, like name, 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 and know the 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 talent that's amongst us, 
um, men and women. And and I think it's uh, I think to your point, Rod, like lift one another up in those talents and in those natural gifts that we all have and possess. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I I'd be remiss if I didn't cap and say uh, not cap like lie, but cap this my my portion off to say like my wife is named Cornetta. So uh, when I anytime I see Coretta Scott King's name, I think of my wife. Um, and and I, that is synonymous to me. Um, and 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 it is a beautiful thing um, that that you know motivates me uh, when I get up every day to you know protect this house. You know what I mean? Um, right. I'm, it, it's important that you know uh, we show up and, and stand up for our women. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I just want to tell the people to check out Go ahead. my tape, rodwallace.bandcamp.com. Yeah. It's called Unfree yeah. Black. Yeah. Hi. Check Hi. that out. Thank yeah. you, brother Blacksmith. Yours too. You better shout yours out. Yeah, man. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, all streaming platforms. Um, just kind of like, you know, at home rap. I wrote wrote the whole record in a pandemic. Um, and I just think, you know, uh, Rod, you gave me an opportunity to do an exercise that I had never done before um, with, with Sound Lab and to write a song um, and make, make a beat, chop up a sample, make a beat, write a song, record a song, and then mix the song. Um, and we did that in a matter of less than, you know, four hours. Four hours. We, did, we did more talking than we did, you know, music making. But it, it, challenged, it challenged me to you know, stretch my limits in, in writing, uh, in soul writing, uh, and, and and really like, just to be able to like craft words together. It's my favorite song on the album. So, oh, you know, thank you for, uh, you know, producing my favorite song <laughs> on my album. Uh, shout out to Gadget. Shout out to Gadget. Shout out to, um, the, to the Dirty Old Man. That's, that, uh, yeah. I, I appreciate that. You got to come back through for that, man. I'm I'm down, man, and I, I've been following the the other sound labs when you had other artists yeah. on, and I just think it's 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 clever, and uh, yeah, I think you're just scratching the surface with it. How often do you do the sound lab? Uh, we try to do it every Saturday. We kind of took uh some time off this last month to, you know, enjoy the holidays with our families on Saturdays because we'd mess around and it'd take all your Saturday. It'd be Indeed. five to ten, you know, the whole Saturday. So yeah, we're looking to get it back back up and popping. Yeah. Cal, man, you want to tell the people about the, the podcast, bro? Yeah, absolutely. Teachers, educators, parents, anybody that has some gems you're trying to drop in a simplistic way, come on my Teach Simple podcast. We focus on providing simple solutions in the classroom. We want to keep it simple because the gems, that's what the simplicity is at. And if you keep it simple for people, you might save some lives. I want to yeah. hear about a teacher that motivated you to get to where you are. If you're a journalist, I want to hear about your favorite English class. If you're a DJ, I want to hear about that that music teacher that taught you how to get your ear right. You know what I'm saying? I care about those intricate, simplistic things that, you know, got you to where you at. So we try to talk about those things for like 15, 20 minutes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Where can I hit you up at, man, if you want to be on a, on the podcast? Yeah. So you can um, hit me up at teachsimple313.com. You can just sign up on the email list. You can also find me um, at teachsimple28 on Instagram and you know I'm on YouTube as well, Mr. Nellum. Yeah, you always be able to find I got a big head. <laughs> <laughs> and and, I, and I'll say this, you know, uh Calvin help, helped me kind of get I think I think high power and you make me better is dense. I think there's a lot of material there. Um and I think that's why we went an hour and a half. So I was planning on dropping uh the second uh, uh, lesson plan, um, kicking off with Nina, um, by Rhapsody and, um, really thinking about how we give tribute to our, our leaders and our loved ones, especially in this time. So Nina is a record that Rhapsody wrote, um, mm -hmm. about Nina Simone. And, uh, I look, I look forward to diving into that song and just this idea of like, how do we lift one another up? Uh, because Nina Simone wrote a song about MLK when he died, um, so I, I, when I listen to the to the to the to the sound that Rhapsody put together, I think it's comparable to um, the, the Love of King is Dead. I think is what it's called that Nina wrote, and so just like how how we how we pay tribute to one another, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and lift one another up through song. And then the other track is Doing It Again by uh, The Roots on uh, How I Got Over, led by Black Thought. He's dropping uh, simile after simile after simile, like chop, chop, chop. And I just, uh, even for myself as a writer and as a teacher, and when I, when I teach writing, it's important that people know the difference between a simile and a metaphor. Um, it's important to know like techniques that are carefully put into, you know, writing a bar. Um, so I'm looking forward to, you know, getting back on and, and dropping, dropping lesson plan two with you guys. All right, yeah, yo, this is a playlist. We got, um, you know, we got some songs for the playlist already. We got um, High Power by Kendrick Lamar. Uh, we got uh, Make Me Better by um, Fabulous featuring, featuring Neo. Rhapsody, uh, it's called Nina, right? And then uh, Do It Again by um, Black Thought. And I'm sorry, Cal. Yeah, so Cage Bird by uh, Jake Dreamville is a Dreamville song. It was inspired by, obviously, Maya Angelou, Cage Bird. But just to say a couple of lyrics, he said, Just like a cage bird, I sing a song, hoping they open up these bars. Send a brother home. I cry when I'm alone. I wonder why would God send me here, knowing that they hate us. Know they make us think we feel like we evil, so we kill our people. Without a second thought, with every lesson taught by real Gs, they full of real brother wisdom, so we proceed. A real brother who has stripped of their humanity. I see the judge's eyes. I know that he ain't understanding me, a cage bird. Um, and I played that song for my young black males in a seminar class. And it was just a really good like metaphor to just talk about, you know, the, the, the life of being a, a, a black person in America. You know, you, you want to fly, but you have these bars that are literally keeping you there. And it, it was a major exercise. It was like six years ago, but I just never forget it. Jay Cole got a uh, Excuse me, Cage Bird by J. Cole, man. Um, you know, and I mean that's the thing for those that's watching. I mean, we we we're gonna come back again uh with another with the next installment of the playlist, uh the Black History playlist. Um goal is to drop a few of these during Black History Month. Um, I mean, and hopefully, you know, as we go through these, you can kind of see that hey, hip hop can be used in ways, you know, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a parent, whether you're a student, you know, to kind of get a deeper understanding to create conversation, to introduce topics, um, right. a, a myriad of ways. Um, this is just ways that we've used in our classroom, ways that you can use it as well at, at home, uh, on your virtual classes. <laughs> uh, and so, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And does anybody have any last thing? I know we kind of already did our last um, segments and everything. So um, if not, I will end off by saying, you know, I am in demand .com. Hit us up. If you are interested, if you are a black man and you're interested in being a volunteer, a mentor, maybe being an educator, uh, hit up I am in demand .com and we can uh, connect you with those resources that you can be involved. So thank you, brothers. Thank you guys for tuning in. Peace.